through for more middle-class homes as well, such as East Mount and Alexandra Villas on Abbey Road. These were the homes of solicitors, shopkeepers and town hall officials. At the top end of the social scale, there were great houses such as Abbotswood, which was on the outskirts of the town and was the home of James Ramsden. Probably the most fascinating of Barrow's housing project was the creation of Vickerstown, a purpose-built area to provide homes for shipyard workers. In 1898, the Isle of Walney Estates Company announced its interest in building houses on Walney. But the company was bought up by Vickers, who were taking on more workers for an expanding shipbuilding programme. Twin estates of North and South Vickerstown were planned, often basic in design, but capable of housing almost a thousand workers. Because it was built at the time of the Boer War, some of the streets are named after generals, such as Lord Roberts, French and Kitchener. Other streets, such as Powerful, Juno and Melampus, were named after vessels, which were built in the local shipyard. The most basic accommodation was in areas like Melampus Street, which had rented homes for labourers and other unskilled workers. There were also bigger houses in Lord Robert Street, Mikasa Street and Ocean Road. The best homes were sited on Empress Drive and the Promenade. The parent company had rigid control over Vickerstown and there was a committee which enforced rules over the people who lived there. I think Vickerstown houses must have been regarded as palaces when you think of Hindpool. There were the different grades of house according to your status in the works, but even the smallest houses compared with houses in other bits of Barrow are really very, very nice indeed. And so many of them had their little gardens and plenty of space around them, so it must have been a lovely, healthy place to live. Tenants were chosen by the firm and their names had to be put forward by their foreman. The first tenants moved in during November 1900 and rents ranged from 5 shillings to 13 shillings a week for a house on the promenade. The houses had electricity but no baths. An attempt was made to create a self-sufficient community with numerous facilities such as shops, a farm and leisure areas. Schools and churches were also needed for this unique community. Of course there was a pub and the King Alfred did good business. Walney Bridge is used by thousands of people every day to cross over from the island to the main town. But the campaign to get a bridge built had gone on for almost 40 years before construction finally started. The growing population and houses at Vickerstown made the problem of access acute. For many years the only means of getting across had been by using fords in the channel and relying on the tide. But after the dock system was opened in the 1860s, the channel was dredged and the fords disappeared. The corporation supplied ten rowing boats to take people across the channel. People began to demand a bridge, but instead the Furnace Railway organised a steam ferry. The early steam ferry caused problems because many people living on Walney complained that they were often marooned between midnight and half past five in the morning when the service did not run. In 1903, a larger chain ferry was introduced to cope with increased traffic generated by the growing residential suburb of Walney. The Vickerstown Chronicle campaigned for a bridge. The newspaper played on words calling it the Bridge of Size. The size of those who wanted it and the size of the estimated construction cost. The saga over Walney Bridge brought the town's two economic giants into conflict. The Furnace Railway, the company which had largely dictated the fortunes of Victorian Barrow, opposed the bridge. They were worried about disruption to shipping in the channel. They also operated the ferry, which was making them a tidy profit. On the other side, Vickers, the company which would dominate the economy during the next century, wanted the bridge. After many meetings, it was decided to go ahead with the bridge-building scheme. It was financed through money from Vickers, along with cash from the rates and loans from the government. The opening of Walney Bridge on the 30th of July 1908 was a great and important day in the history of the town. There was a horse carriage procession led by the mayor and mayoress who opened it. Troops also assembled for the ceremony. But there was a sting in the tail for those who would use it for years to come. 
That's because a toll was charged and this would continue until 1935. The original toll was half a penny. Around 50,000 people crossed the bridge every week in those first years, which produced a tidy income from foot passengers alone. The Duchess of York, shortly before she became Queen due to the abdication crisis, renamed Walney Bridge as Jubilee Bridge. This was in honour of the 25th anniversary of George V's accession to the throne. It seemed a good opportunity to free it from being a toll bridge ever again. The ending of the toll was the result of long discussions between the council, vicars and the Ministry of Transport. A visit from a member of the royal family was always a welcome event for people in Barrow. Despite its relative isolation, there were a number of occasions. The Duke and Duchess of York boarded HMS Ajax during their 1935 visit to the town. During the First World War, King George V regularly went on visits throughout the country to bolster morale. He was given a tour of the vicar's works to find out more details about the factory's contribution to the war effort. The Prince of Wales, who later became Edward VIII before he abdicated, visited the town in 1927. He carried out various engagements, including meeting veterans from the Great War at the War Memorial. He also opened a convalescent home for local people. The Duke of Kent also visited Barrow. In Ramsden Square in 1936, he toured some facilities for the unemployed. They were called voluntary occupational centres. In the early years, as Barrow continued to grow and the town's industrial base developed, there had been a flood of workers into the town. Most of them were young men and sometimes married ones who travelled without their families. Once work was found, they had plenty of spending money and the public houses did a roaring trade. Pubs could be found on just about every corner. Drunkenness became a serious problem and the town began to get a bad name. Barrow did get a reputation as a rather rough place, noted for its drunkenness and noted for its very boisterous nature of the people who lived there. This isn't really surprising. It was a heavy industrial town. The sort of work that many of the men did was the sort of work where they, after they finished work they would often go to the pub. And of course it was quite traditional in the heavy industries for men to drink very heavily. So it's not surprising that it did get this reputation. And, of course, mixed up with that reputation for, for drunkenness was a reputation for being really rather bolshy. But the pubs did some good, as they were a valuable release from the tensions of work and overcrowded houses. There were also a growing number of prostitutes. All kinds of workmen arrived, and the town started to get a reputation as something of an English Chicago, where anyone could get a job. There was rapid growth, toughness, an industrial boom and a degree of lawlessness. But even though Barrow's reputation was growing increasingly rough and ready, there were also new industries which brought employment for women too. James Ramsden, the man behind so many of Barrow's wealth-creating schemes, also set up the Jute Works in 1872 with the idea of providing work mainly for women and children. It eventually became the largest jute factory in